deliver a speech that should not be longer than five minutes. Everyone ready to go? Awesome. So let's get started. First off, I want to say a big thank you to our lovely audience and our judges for a fun debate round. We're really excited to be doing this for you guys this morning. So let's start off with our resolution today. Human genetic modification is desirable. Now before we get into that resolution, we have to define a few key terms, starting off with human genetic modification. Now of course, humans refers to people like us, and genetic modification refers to the development and application of technology by humans that permit direct manipulation of genetic material in order to alter the heredity traits of a cell, organism, or population. And when we're talking about desirable, we're talking about wanted or wished for as being an attractive, useful, or necessary course of action. Basically, our weighing mechanism for this round is that the benefits with relating to human genetic modifications ultimately outweigh the benefits, or outweigh the risks. So let's start off by going into my first main point, talking about tackling and defeating diseases. Now when it comes to human genetic modification, one of the biggest benefits that come with it is being able to tackle these deadly diseases. According to a 2015 article from the National Human Genome Research Institute, there are a number of genetic mutations that humans can suffer from with no cure, such as cystic fibrosis. And additionally, in a 2016 article, or I'm sorry, a 2016 essay for the New England Journal of Medicine, Eric S. Landers talks about five specific, specific diseases that could potentially be cured as a result of genetic modification. One of them is HIV. Currently, 1% of the U.S. population has to deal with this deadly disease, and as of right now, there's currently no cure. However, scientists have discovered that by deleting the CCR5 gene within the HIV gene, that would potentially have it cure itself, and it would be unable to copy the gene. It also, he also lists four other diseases, including genetic blindness, which would be able to get, uh, be stopped in the tracks as a result of genetic modification. Familiar hypochlorestera can be edited, um, the liver cells can be edited, and it will be stopped in its tracks. Single cell anemia can also be cured as well, and hemophilia would also be cured by editing the blood stem cells, and it's something that is um, affecting one in 5,000 U.S. Americans. So by having human genetic modifications, we would be able to wipe this disease entirely. And additionally, um, we have to talk about the next main point that I have for you guys, which is food scar scarcity. Now, as we know, food scarcity is something that is real and currently happening in our world. Our world is growing at a massive rate. We have huge population growth. In a 2015 article from Newsweek, GMO scientists, um, it, in an article entitled, entitled, GMO scientists could save the world from hunger if we let them, it talks about how population growth is expected to reach 9 billion people by the year 2050. Now, with all of those people, we have to find a way to feed them. And GMOs have proven to be an effective way to solve that hunger crisis. Now, there is a gene or a method of tackling this called CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short <laughs> Palindromatic Re Respects. So it's a pretty fancy name for tackling it. But essentially what it is, is it's a trick that bacteria uses to protect themselves from lethal, lethal viruses, and they kind of act like little cellular saboteurs in a way. Now, something that farmers have to deal with is these agriculture disasters. They'll plant entire crops and some kind of disaster will come and we won't be able to harvest those crops as a result of these disasters. However, with GMOs, it would actually be a proven way to protect these crops and ensure that that food doesn't go to waste and it actually goes to the people who need it the most. Now, of course, there is a stigma behind GMOs. However, when we take a closer look at GMOs, the fact of the matter is it's actually a lot safer than you might think. GMO safety is actually pretty good. According to a 2016 Pew Research poll, 88% of U.S. scientists believe that GMOs are absolutely harmless. And that includes a representative sample of scientists who have been um, connected to the American Association for the Agriculture Advancement of Science. Additionally, a 2015 U.S. Supreme Court decision but, um, of 7 to 1 concluded that genetically modified alfalfa plants are absolutely safe. Additionally, the USDA also approves GMOs for use in our foods, and in a 2016 long-term study, it found that 12 multi-generational, um, in 12 uh, multi-generational studies, that um, food, food and chemical talks, uh, food and uh, that genetically modified plants have the exact same um, nutrition and are equal to non-GMO plants, and so you get that same nutrition. 
And so when we look back at the case we have today, the fact that we can tackle diseases and hunger with the use of human genetic modification is something that we absolutely have to focus on. There is that stigma and the concern behind it. However, ultimately, the benefits outweigh the risks, and that's why we have to vote for the affirmative today. All right, two minutes of cross-examination. All right, let's begin. First, how are you doing today? Doing great, how are you doing? I'm doing just dandy. So my first question today is on the definition, specifically on human genetic modifications. You stated that this is a modification to the gene of the human body, correct? Um, that it is a genetic modification done by humans. Done by humans? Yeah, so okay. not necessarily specifically in the human body, but it could be in the human body, but it could also apply to crops and plants as well. Okay. Um, and then on your first contention, you specifically talk about how uh, the genetic, uh, human genetic modifications can help battle uh, diseases such as HIV, sickle cell anemia. Do we actually have any studies showing a continual success of um, human genetic modifications creating a, fully, uh, a full cure for these diseases? Studies haven't been done yet as a result of U.S. regulation and the stigma behind it. However, scientists have found the potential for genetic modifications to solve these diseases and that um, by editing the gene that it can um, wipe them out entirely. Okay, and then on your second uh, contention, you talk about food scarcity uh, being able to be solved by GMOs, genetically modified organisms. And you believe that genetically modified organisms fall under the category of human genetic modification because the humans are the ones changing the genes of these organisms? That is correct. Okay, wonderful. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Well, great. We'll now net recognize the first negative speaker for a speech not to exceed six minutes. Roadmap's on time or off time? Off time. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be first touching on Austin's case and his arguments that he brought up, and then I'm going to be explaining uh, some of my arguments and why I believe that this is not going to be a desirable thing. All right, is everybody ready? Cool, let's begin. First, I want to thank everyone for being here. I know you guys kind of have to be because, you know, grades. But thank you for listening to what we have to say about this debate. Um, so, yeah, let's just get straight into this. First, on his definitions, I'd like to clarify that human genetic modification is the manipulation of genes of the human body, not of any other organism. It specifically refers to us manipulating gene and gene coding, specifically the DNA of a human or an individual that identifies under human under the human uh, spectrum, which means that it's the GMO arguments are not actually going to stand within this debate, but I'll get to that further down uh, when I get on to his case. So let's get on his first contention, where he talks about the diseases that are happening. My first argument to this is going to be that the Buck Institute for Science explains in 2016 that the National Institute of Health Director of the United States emphasizes the Bureau's policy to not fund any human genetic modification projects because of ethical dilemmas regarding the technology that's being used. Specifically, there are no safety guidelines currently in place for um, us to be able to operate genetic modification safely, which means that the only human genetic modifications that are occurring are happening through privately funded organizations that don't have specific guidelines, which poses major risks to not only human safety, but we'll get further into why this poses a risk when we get on to my case. But then my second argument to this is that without the lack of, with the lack of research that's being done in the field of safe human genetic modification, it poses too much of a risk, and since we have not seen yet any actual cure for the major diseases that my opponent uh, brought up within his speech, we can see that there's going to be no propensity to desire human genetic modification because it has no means to solve within the status quo. But then when we get on to his second argument about food security, we can see that this isn't actually going to play a role within this debate today. We're talking about human genetic modifications. This is the modification to the human genome or the DNA of the human body. Us looking at organisms such as food or um, bugs or animals is not going to play a role within this debate because this isn't what this debate is talking about. If we were talking about GMOs, it would be in the resolution, but that's not what this debate is on. So let's go on to my off-case arguments. My first counter contention is going to be this. The thesis is that the otherization of unwanted individuals will always create systemic oppression. Now this sounds very big and wordy, but here's what it comes down to. 
when we put a stigma on individuals that are not typical or that have malfunctions to their human genes, we then create a mindset that justifies an us-them dichotomy. We look down on them as being less than human just because they have a different propensity of how their bodies function. Specifically, we can see that the Journal of Biomedical Science reports in 2017, sorry, 615, that human genetic engineering is the alteration of organisms' genetic material to eliminate undesirable characteristics. This now creates a world where we can label and categorize people based upon desirable or undesirable uh, functions of their body, which now creates this dichotomy between the abled and disabled people. This dichotomy guarantees us to be able to justify oppression of these individuals. The second warrant to this is that in World War II, this was the same logic that drove Hitler to be able to eradicate, eradicate the Jewish people. When he looked down on the Jews as not being a desirable people and he wanted to purify the population, he used this by saying that they have unwanted traits or that they're not human or less than human, which allowed him to be able to justify the killing of these people. The implication of this is going to be that the dehumanization on a global scale will now create a stigma against any any individual who isn't desirable. But then the second point is that this actually reverts any social progress made by re-establishing a hierarchy where the abled individuals are now viewed as the only desirable way to live. This is going to cause too many implications on a global mindset when we see that individuals that are quote unquote disabled or less desirable are now going to be looked down upon and treated as less than human when they're just as human as anybody else. Which means that automatically when we see that there's no implications or positive outcomes for human genetic modification, the negative case is going to outweigh. But then my second argument is going to be lack of research. The thesis is that the lack of research and in-depth analysis poses more risk than it does benefit. The first argument is that the standard university, Stanford University School of Medicine specifically states that there has been little to no research done to justify the risk of human genetic modification. Specifically, germline editing or the passing of new genetic modification down from generation to generation poses a severe threat. The uh, report done by Stanford specifically says that, says that when we interject any human modification, there's a risk of human error now coming in the way of evolutionary process. At the point where we interject human error into evolutionary process, we pose a risk of affecting how these individuals can live. Specifically, there's a risk of creating chronic illnesses from generation to generation because we don't know how these human genetic modifications are going to be able to be adapted by the individual's body, which means that when we create these chronic illnesses lasting for generations, these individuals are, one, not going to be able to work or actually provide for themselves because they have chronic illnesses that are going to make them stay home and not be able to actually function within a given society, but that it's not actually going to solve the problems that they're having because there's only a risk for them to have more problems. Which leads us to the second argument that without the proper research done and not and there's no funding on a, a, a universal scale, we can see that the cost of these uh, procedures being done are going to lead to the astronom uh, to lead to astronomical costs of procedures being done for individuals, which is only going to push them into poverty because they can't actually afford the treatments that needing to be done. Which means you can see that even at a base level, this um, is only going to cause more harms than it will good and is not a desirable thing. Thank you. All right, two minutes cross examination. Ready to go? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So the first question I have for you: If you talk about the ethical dilemmas that come with um, genetic genetic modification, mm -hmm. can you talk about some of those ethical dilemmas? Yes, so what happens is at the point where we're now affecting how the body is able to function on a typical scale, individuals have a natural way of their bodies processing. That's how science works. Evolution has made our bodies work in a certain way. At the point where humans now determine what should be the way that somebody is living or the way that their body should be functioning, we're now allowing for a human to decide what's best for another human and also posing the risk of technology harming these individuals' bodies or putting a risk on these chronic illnesses actually occurring. Okay, but wouldn't you say that like any type of medicine kind of interferes with the natural processes that happen within humans? Not necessarily. A lot of the medicine that we use are actually medicine that's either A, produced in our bodies naturally, or B, we've done enough research to show that they can work alongside the processes that our bodies have. There's not enough research done on human genetic modifications to show that the, uh, re the uh, actual procedures that are being done can actually function alongside our body's normal processes, which could create these chronic illnesses. 
All right, and another point that you made is talking about the astronomical cost that would come with this. Now, can you kind of elaborate on how patients would be able to afford this and what that cost would go towards? Yes, because there's no guidelines done on a national level by the governmental entity, only private organizations are currently funding procedures uh, done of human genetic modifications, and at the point where we leave funding done to private organizations, they're allowed to charge anything they want because they're a private corporation. We can see this done when we don't have medical insurance. We have to go to a doctor or private organization that can charge us hundreds, even thousands, and tens of thousands of dollars for a procedure that shouldn't cost that much, and that's what's happening at this point. Is there, There's no coverage for us to be able to get these done at a cheaper cost, which means it's going to be millions of dollars out of our pocket. I have no further questions. Great. All right. Moving right along, we'll now recognize the affirmative, the second affirmative uh, speech. <coughs> Ready to go? Yes. Alright. Alright. So let's get started by talking about my opponent's main arguments. Now, he made a lot of really great arguments. However, the fact of the matter is, the benefits still outweigh the risk. And while there are risks with everything, the benefit that we can have with human genetic modification is absolutely desirable. So let's first start off by talking about the ethical dilemma that my opponent mentions. Now, he talks about how humans have a natural way to deal with things. However, as we've seen throughout history, history, we have medicine. And while some medicine does occur naturally, the fact is, not all medicine does occur naturally. And humans do interfere in that sense. And when you see the progress that we've made as a result of medicine, you'll see that this can have the same impact as well. And that we can have the potential to solve diseases. And through diseases like HIV, genetic blindness, sickle cell anemia, and hemophilia, we can solve this through human genetic modification. And now we are entering new territory, and as of right now, there are still um, areas that we can explore, kind of like the medicine that we have early on. That was new territory, and there was still a lot to explore with that, and that is what we are seeing today. Human genetic modification is definitely a new area, and that's something that we can absolutely explore. However, we need to erase the stigma and absolutely focus on what we can do in solving these diseases. Second, let's go on to my second main point, talking about food scarcity. In a debate round, the affirmative have the right to define certain terms. And as I have done in the first speech, human genetic modification refers to genetic modification that is done by humans. And so that does have the food scarcity point um, valid in this round. And so we can talk about that. And so we can see through that main point that GMOs can have a lasting effect on solving our um, hunger um, <coughs> epidemic in the world. With over 9 billion people expected by 2050, we have to have a way to tackle it. And unless we enact the solution, we can't guarantee that that food will be available. And with things like agriculture disaster, these crops are becoming more and more difficult to grow, especially with global warming and the changing climate that we have going on in our world. Second, let's talk about another main point that my opponent mentioned, talking about the oppression from those who might be considered desirable. Now, with the human genetic modification, it is an area that we can, that we have to really focus on because there's different ways to tackle it. However, we have to focus on the idea that we can tackle diseases. When we're talking about millions upon millions of people suffering from these deadly diseases, we have to find a way to tackle it. And with that, we have to look at genetic modification as a viral, viral, viable way to tackling this because with these millions of people, there is no cure and they have to live a lifelong disease that is harmful and it's something that we have to absolutely focus on. Second, with the research that we have, we need to, as I said before, erase the stigma and we need to be able to explore this area. As with earlier medicine, this is an area that we need to really look at as a viable option to solving these diseases. So when we can tackle diseases and hunger with one solution, it's something that we can't forget. Moving right along, we'll now turn the floor over to the second negative team for a constructive speech not to exceed five minutes. Okay, as a brief roadmap, I'm going to give you an overview of the two world scenario that's happening right now. I'm going to do a little bit of a line by line uh, explanation and then give you some voting issues at the end as to why you're going to be preferring the negative team to take. So let's get into this debate right away. 
when we look towards the resolution today, we can see that when we look towards human genetic modification being desirable, it's going to be undesirable for two key reasons. One, it poses too many ethical dilemmas to the safety of the human body and a generational safety that's happening. But then we can also see that it also uh, creates a new stigma upon this dichotomy between an abled and disabled body. But let's look at this on a line-by-line -line argument on my opponent's case specifically. He goes back to this GMO argument and says that the affirmative has the right to de define the terms in the round and that this includes GMOs. My argument against this is yes, the affirmative has the right to define the terms in the round as long as they define them fairly. And I do not believe that he had defined them fairly because human genetic modification is the modification to the human genome. That is literally what the words are saying. If we allow for GMOs to play a role within this debate, we're not providing fair ground for the negative team, which is why I believe we should only look towards arguments based on human genetic modification, which is why you're going to be ignoring the second contention. So let's look at the first contention where I made a clear argument towards the ethical obligation that we have to not look, to not actually perform these operations because there's not enough research done at the point where there is no federal funding for these projects done because there's no safe research or guidelines being proposed. It means that there's too much risk of these illnesses occurring to these individual bodies and there's too much risk of harms happening at a generational level that could cause rapid illnesses to occur in even multi-generations, which means we're now affecting millions of people across the globe at no propensity to actually save them. My opponent brought up no research that shows Shows that this is actually a safe procedure that can solve any problems. He just says there's hypothetical things that can happen that we can potentially save people, but if we're causing too many risks and creating an actual stigma against a disabled body, there's already going to be too many harms happening now that we're not going to be able to solve for um, without any actual research being done. But then when you look on my case, you can specifically um, see that he made the first argument that not all medicine uh, works naturally and it's not all produced by the body. My first argument against this is that medicine does function safely with the body even if it's not produced naturally and there's no research done for human genetic modification to show that it works safely with the human body which is where my argument still stands but then his second argument against this is that the medicine in the past Work, that when we applied human uh, medicine to the human body in the past, it safely functioned. My first argument is, no it didn't. We killed hundreds of people when we were first trying to implement medicine. Looking to the Civil War, when we were expanding medicine uh, across the globe, it was not safe and it was not easy, and people died because we didn't understand how to safely implement medical procedures, which means that the research needs to be done first to find safe ways to actually implement these projects, which means that when we have no research done in the first place, it's not going to be desirable because it's going to cause too many risks. But then on my first counter contention, his only argument against this is that we have to find a way to tackle these diseases. I totally agree, but it needs to be a safe way. If we're causing too many harms and chronic illnesses to millions of people across the globe, this is not the safe way to do it. We need to put more research in first before implementing actual projects to be done. But then he drops all of my implications at the bottom of this contention, which are going to show that a dehumanization on a global scale will only create the stigma that he's talking about in the first place. We're only going to perpetuate the stigma of an us-them dichotomy between abled and disabled people, where we're now looking at other people as less than human. That's not okay, that's not ethical, and it's not moral. If we allow ourselves to justify looking at these individuals as less than human, we're no better off than literally Literally Hitler. It sounds like a terrible thing to say, but it's true because he used the same logic to justify the atrocities that he did in World War II. But then on my second argument, you can see that his uh, he just says that we need to erase this stigma and look into these procedures, but no, he's going to be creating this stigma at, at the point where we're now labeling people as being good or typical or desirable. We need to accept all individuals and all bodies because they should be accepted as human because they are human. If we can find safe ways to do these procedures and and there is a consent to do these procedures, that's fine, but now is not the time to do it because there is not enough research done to show that we can safely implement this. So when you look into the two worlds of this debate, you can see that the affirmative's only argument is a potential for safety that has no research to support it, whereas the negative shows that one, a stigma is going to
going to be created on a global scale, but then you're also going to see that there's too much risk of chronic illness and death occurring at an astronomical rate, and that the costs are going to be too high for privately funded treatment, that there's no preference to actually see that human genetic modification is going to be desirable in the instance of this debate, which is why you're going to be voting for the negative team. Thank you. And finally, we'll turn the floor back over to the affirmative for the final summary not to exceed three minutes. Radio? All right. All right. So, of course, I want to say a big thank you to everyone again and our lovely judges for a fun debate round. It's been a pleasure being, for you, being here for you guys this morning. So, let's look back once again to our resolution today. Human genetic modification is desirable. And as I've stated in the opening speech, Human genetic modification does refer to genetic modification done by humans, and so we have to look at it through that aspect. Now, as I said before, my opponent has made some excellent arguments talking about it. However, with everything, there are risks. And when, I look, when we look back at the weighing mechanism that I have set for this round, we have to talk about the benefits outweighing the risks. And when we look at the benefits that I have outlined for you guys today, you have to see that these benefits ultimately outweigh the risks. First, talking about tackling and defeating diseases. Now, there are diseases that we have to absolutely tackle immediately, and genetic modification has been proven to be a, a scenario that we can use for solving these diseases. My opponent talks about how in the 1800s, then the Civil War, there were people who were dying as a result of medicine. Now, that was the 1800s. When we look at medicine today and the way we tackle diseases in 2017, it's definitely much different than, than back in the Civil War. And with these, we have seen that scientists are able to have the ability to edit genes to wipe out these diseases. And so we need to look into that because, as I stated, millions of people are dying from these diseases. And if we're just sitting here doing nothing and letting them suffer from these diseases, we can't say that we did anything to help them. And so we need to make a change and uh, do something for these diseases. Otherwise, future generations could continue suffering from these diseases. And second, going back to my GMO arguments, as I've stated and as I've said for this round, GMOs are a very viable way to tackling food um, scarcity and the hunger around the world. GMOs have been proven to really solve for the agriculture disasters and food shortages that we have seen all throughout the world. And scientists and officials have, could have agreed that GMOs are very safe and that there is nothing to worry about in terms of the safety and it's a very viable way to tackle it. Another point that my opponent mentions is that it will create that stigma between the us-them dichotomy and the able and disabled. However, the fact is that's simply not the case. When we look at the point that I have made, we're talking about tackling diseases. So it's not a matter of saying they're less human to, than us. Than us, it's the it's the idea of really just having them deal with these diseases. Now we might not have to deal with them, but they have to, and so we need to do all that we can to help them. Um, no longer suffer from these diseases. And so, when we look at the main points I've discussed today, tackling and defeating diseases and food scarcity, we have to vote for the affirmative today and say that human genetic modification is desirable. As I've set out through the weighing me mechanism, the benefits ultimately outweigh the risks. Now, my opponent has mentioned a certain risk, but with anything, there are risks, and we can't ignore that. However, when we look at the benefits that I've outlined for you guys today, we see that those do outweigh the risks, and that's why we're voting for the affirmative today. Thank you.